let's introduce our speakers, both very interesting speakers tonight. Our first speaker is uh, Boris Gunnewag, who's doing a postdoc in bioinformatics. And particularly, he's using advanced data analytics techniques of various kinds to try to work out what causes Parkinson's disease and hopefully cure it. So uh, that's a big challenge, and I hope you succeed. Over to Boris. <laughs> Thank you so much, Arzi for that kind introduction. It's uh, quite intimidating to speak in, uh, in front of such a uh, knowledgeable crowd. My background is in chemistry. I only started um, doing big data analysis a couple of years ago. And, um, but I discovered very quickly in working with um, diseases that um, in the end, we end up with massive amount of data and um, the tools we are using might still be um, optimizable and that's one of the main reasons why I got myself uh, convinced to speak in front of this crowd. Maybe you guys have some input which could help me in the end to tackle a couple of my pro problems. So, um, Bear with me, I have a bit of um, biology in the beginning. I try to keep it as, um, as, as easy as possible and um, yeah, and that's, that's just the start. So, um, Thank you so much for coming around. It's such a beautiful evening. It's, uh, I wouldn't have thought that such a big group of people would uh, show up here. What I'm going to talk to bar about today is what are we looking at? Like, what are we actually, why are we doing data analysis at the Garden Institute in the field I'm working at? Um, how does our data look? What is the problem with that data? And how do we try to find differences in it? Um, one, tool which is very commonly used in bioinformatics is differential expression analysis. We use co-expression networks and I will talk a bit more what, what these techniques mean and um, maybe you have some input later on um, how to optimize these kind of things. Um, I started um, developing an interest in statistical learning in the last couple of months or years and um, yeah that's basically what I'm going to show you today and um, see how we go. So. Um, as I'm working in a, a medical research institute, we are interested in disease. It's not a big surprise. Um, usually, um, the case with the disease is when it's untreated with, um, with a certain amount of time, the severity of the disease increases. So at some point, um, you get symptoms, you have a cough, when you have a cold at some point, and at that point in time, you, you probably start um, going to your doctor, he, other some diagnosis, and um, in a good case scenario, you get a treatment, and your symptoms go away, and your disease goes away. Um, with incurable diseases, like neurodegenerative diseases, as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and schizophrenia and other parts we are dealing with, um, you get a diagnosis, but um, these diseases are basically incurable so far, because we don't know anything about that. Um, one of our main advantages would be to um, diagnose these diseases before they become symptomatic and that can only be done, um, that's quite a tricky task because um, how, do you, how do you diagnose the disease when you don't even know that you have it? So um, with that early diagnosis what would be capable is we could treat it at an earlier point and it might not even break out. That's the premises of personalized medicine, that's the premises of um, genomics and transcriptomics, what I'm going to give an introduction today about. So, um, most diseases, it's, 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 um, to a certain extent, are a combination of genetic and environmental influences. Like, even if you break yourself, if you break a bone, like, the chance that your bone breaks at a certain stress is, to a large extent, terminated by your bone density that is um, dependent on your genetic underlying disposition. So um, what is that? As like every biologist can clearly see, this is a cell. They all look like that. We have 37 trillions of them in our body. 
I'm going to insert a lot of biologists today with my slides. So, um, um, so in the cell we have the DNA. The DNA contains our genome and all the information which makes us a uh, human being in the end. But like DNA is common to pretty much every organism on, on, on this planet. And um, the moment this information is getting utilized, it's getting transcribed into RNA, and um, then this RNA goes out into the cell and does its function. It doesn't really matter what it does, it does, it does its own function. So the moment we have a mutation in our genome, um, that certain RNA molecule is not produced anymore. Cool. Or well, not so cool, in the end. So um, at that point in time, looking at our genome might enable us to see if, do you have a mutation in that certain point in time? Will this, will you get a disease and therefore can we diagnose you earlier before you get symptoms? So we can look at the um, DNA at that point in time. Cool. So what is, what is, what is, what is DNA? DNA is the major component of, of the human genome. The human genome, as I said, is the program which you get from, from your mom and your dad, um, which combines um, um, all the information which is necessary to build the fetus and um, get you into uh, an adult. And how much information actually is stored in that genome, you can see in identical twins, um, which um, look pretty much the same to a large extent. I'm standing here right here. So, um, um, the moment there's a mutation, this is an electro, um, an EMR picture of, 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 of a DNA, and the moment there's a mutation at some point, we might get a disease. So, the human genome in a nutshell is, um, this is basically the data we're dealing it with, and that's why it's complicated. We have 3.2 billion pairs of letters in the human genome, which is ACTT, four letters, and we have 3.2 billion in each of our single cells in that. One variant or one mutation in each of these variants can cause a disease. So there are a couple of single gene disorders, which is, means, okay, one variant creates a disease like um, um, Huntington's, for example, cystic fibrosis are just to name two of them. Most diseases by, uh, are actually not single gene disorders, they are they're complex, so it means multiple diseases play a role, complex disease, like diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases, things like that. So how common is it that we actually have a variant? We, we estimate that we have three million variants which um, in average are different between me and everybody else in, 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 in this group. And over a hundred of them, which each of them is carrying, it is increasing our risk to get a certain disease. So that's the first thought. Um, um, why is this data suddenly accessible? Like looking at the human genome, that was basically um, the human genome um, project started in the 1990s. Um, I wasn't even in school then, I think. And it was, um, and it finished in 2003. So they they spent estimated three billion U.S. dollars to get the first human genome sequenced. That finished in 2003. This price plummeted over the time, and in the last year, in 2014, Lumina announced the $1,000 genome. So instead of spending $3 billion for one genome, we can now sequence $1 billion, so we can read out every single one of these 3 2 billion letters for $1,000. Um, the Garden Institute, where I work, oh, I actually wrote that down. Um, the Garvin Institute has this machine park, it's called the X10. At full capacity, um, hopefully this year, we can start pumping out 350 genomes a week. It's 80,000 genomes a year. So um, data-wise, this is quite um, astonishing. So we are thinking like capacity, we are currently there. Like there are approximately like just shy of a million genomes sequenced so far. With the current speed in 2025, we're going to be in, we're going to create an exabyte of data just with um, human gene information. And everybody got crazy when we started calculating it. So that is a Nature article from last August, where they basically say, okay, storing and processing genome data will um, will exceed what what it takes to run YouTube and Twitter. So the genome data becomes more and more abundant. 
and is more and more accessible for our research. Um, as I mentioned before, most diseases are a combination of genetic and environmental influences. Um, when you are, like me, interested in diseases which are not genetically based, like 100%, we have to look at the environmental component of it. Do those numbers take into account the fact that most people with genomes are the same? Good point. You mentioned that you said that we're going to have this huge amount of data, but there's a huge compression factor. Yes, yes, there is. And people, we're actually not utilizing that till now, which is quite funny. So what's the compression? Sure oh, you can you can basically you can basically start building a genome file as saying and, and and just make a delta genome and say like only where where's the difference and that that would be so the difference is 0.01 percent and that that would be a capability but our um, the problem we have is that um, that um, our techniques how we deal with the raw data improve over the years so we still don't want to throw away our raw data at that point in time so. So you have a lossless compression because even if most people genomes are the same, and you only have to store the delta. Uh, wait, wait. It's, it's 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 a bit more complicated than actually like we we. I come to that in a second. The, the the data we read is much shorter than the genome as itself. We only read fragments and we piece it together. So there's still certain regions which we don't know yet and which are like highly repetitive in their sequence and therefore very, very hard to reassemble. And we, we still build our genomes based on aligning it to a reference genome and not reassembling every time from scratch. So that um, there might be our annotation might still be improved. And that's why a delta genome by itself might not be the ultimate answer at that's, that point in time. But it will definitely be. And there are, there are multi multiple approaches to, to, to do that. And, Lots of smart people are looking into it for me. Um, so the environmental component is basically, as, as we discussed before, okay, we have our genome and that is getting transcribed into RNA and into, into the cell and, and does its function there. Um, but um, a cell is never, never completely um, secluded from its, from its environment. The environment has a huge impact how this RNA is transcribed from the DNA. And the combination of those of the genetic component and the environment is, is mirrored in the RNA. So what we do is what, which is called the transcriptome. We take the RNA out of our samples and sequence it and quantify it. So basically we, we build matrices and we say, okay, RNA1 is with this frequency abundant in this kind of tissue in this individual or in, in this species. So this is where, where our data starts. Um, so to update our disease switch here, like we are not looking, we are not interested in DNA in my research, but in RNA. Sweet. So from that on, um, Parkinson's disease is a very, very good example for, um, for, for, for a combination of the genetic and the environmental component. We, for example, know people living in rural areas have a higher chance of getting Parkinson's because most probably they drink water from which is contaminated by a lot of herbicides and things like that. That is the underlying hypothesis. We just know we see we see an increase of Parkinson cases in rural areas. So um, what is Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's disease is the most common neurodegenerative disease. Um, I also work on Alzheimer's, but I know a bit more about Parkinson's as well. I'm presenting that if you guys have questions afterwards. And um, it affects 7 million people globally. And it basically happens in the substance. Nigra, and the moment we are getting diagnosed with Parkinson's, the neurons or part of that area are already dead. So the point, the point when we are getting diagnosed, the disease, the disease is already that advanced that we can't really do anything for that tissue at all, and the effects are basically a loss of, of brain function due to loss of neuro, neurons at that point in time. So there's no treatment at all in this disease. Like there are there are certain treatments which alleviate the symptoms, but there's nothing to cause to, to slow or cure the underlying the underlying condition. And that is basically due to the point that we have no idea what the real biological mechanism is on, on, under it. So um, <clears throat> this is where data science then could help. We want to try to basically to find the changes in these big matrices between cases and controls. So we have big data sets, 
big matrices, and we see um, we can harvest that from people who have Parkinson's disease and who had Parkinson's disease in that case, and people who are healthy. And that would enable us to, 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 to find biomarkers, which would enable an earlier diagnosis. We could monitor the pre disease progression. We could target drugs much more directly. We, would have, we could see which drug actually works for people based on that data. And we could find, identify pathways to modify the disease and modify a, a, a therapy at that point in time. And that is basically enabled in the last couple of years by generating this big data set from the sequences to, to, to into, the, into the structure. And that finally would um, enable us to investigate the underlying biology in that, in that point. Cool, where do we start? Um, so um, just to sum up, the, 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 the biggest problem we are having is our data is very, very broad, as, as, as I mentioned already. It's, uh, in the, uh, the smallest feature size could be one nucleotide or one letter in the human genome, which is 3.2 billion features. And our um, data is very shallow. Like, I mainly deal with post-mortem human brains. It's not that easy to get them. Um, <laughs> There are a lot of ethics involved until we are allowed to deal with these kind of um, specimen. Even if you work with mice and all, generating this data is, is, is costly and expensive. It takes a lot of time and expertise in the lab to, to, to set that up. That's why our N is still small. So we have a massive P over N problem, basically. The data is quite high dimensional. And um, our genes are, or features are correlated. And they act in additive fashion, which doesn't make it easier to to analyze it at the end. So how do we analyze it? Like As I said before, we have the transcriptome, the features in the RNA combination of genes, genetic, and environment. Um, the problem is our machine can only read 125 letters and not 3.2 billion one in one go. So we have to hack up whatever we take out of the cell into pieces of 125 to extract the data. Once we have that, we get millions and millions of these reads. Like one sample set is usually 30 to 100 million of reads. And what we do then is we put them back together in two ways. Either we take the reads and align them back to our reference, to our genome, and see where do they stick. Or we try to assemble them from you know, with a greedy camera algorithm or different other types of ways where we basically try to find an overlap and basically create longer features. Both of these techniques, or pretty much every technique we're dealing with, are computationally very, very expensive. So um, how do we do that? We um, do that at um, Garden with, we have an in-house cluster, um, which has 15,000 cores and 10 terabytes of RAM. And we build a little um, pipeline where like, there are constantly algorithms developed to do a certain specific task in a better way. And as a bioinformatician, you have to read the literature and update your pipeline um, and chain it all together, basically. And we use very, very primitive measures to do that. But in the end, like all these, all these little gray boxes here are snippets of code, how we, how we um, analyze our data. And that is here. Um, uh, I pulled that out on Sunday afternoon when I was remaking my slides. That's the RAM usage on our cluster. You can see on Monday, people start working. And then they do nothing. <laughs> and then it's Friday again and they get hectic. <laughs> and, and Sunday morning was rainy, so the people were sitting in front of their computer again. It's quite funny to see that. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, our cluster is not big enough for our needs. We, like, when I started, we were like five or six bioinformaticians. Maybe now we have 50. Um, so we have to utilize um, ECL, um, the, the Australian research um, cluster, and we're trying to do that with virtualization software to easily transfer our pipeline from HAP. So cool. That was the biology talk. So now comes the part where you guys are more um, the experts. So differential expression analysis. As just to remember, we have our healthy individuals, and we might have a certain um, transcript or feature which we call RNA1. And we might have in our PD individuals or samples, we might have RNA1 in a much greater abundance. So our, our initial data is basically quantified based on that. 
then we get um, our matrices are in general 20 to 200,000 features broad and 6 to 130,000 samples deep. That's what we start dealing with. And um, one of the most intuitive ways is simply to compare which transcript or which feature is up or down in average in case versus control, PD versus health, whatever you want to call it. First way to look at that is we, um, we, we look at the relative log expression to see do we, how hard do we have to normalize, what, how does the data look. Sometimes we sequence deeper, sometimes there might be a technical error, sometimes we can filter. Filtering and normalization makes this plot much more um, <coughs> homogeneous, and that's the first way to look at this data. What we have in the back of our head is like this data is based on people. So they have a different age the moment they die. They have a different gender. They have been on the table a bit longer until we got the specimen. There are different technical covariants. To a certain extent, we know them. A lot of them we don't know. The ones we know, we can work with. The most interesting one for us is obviously disease. So looking at the data, the first step what I usually do is a decomposition of the principal component analysis. I probably don't have to explain that here. So that first first principal component needs to describe the biggest biggest um, big, biggest um, decomposition of the data in, in one one dimension. And what we want to see basically, what we see here is these uh, numbers are individuals. We want to see like more or less a separation in our first principal component according to disease. So there is an underlying subset of features in that data which shifts it towards of, apart from each other, which is very uh, calming at that point in time because basically means we can analyze this data and try to distill information out of that in that regard. Um, then I usually try to um, run an ANOVA. I, I fit, a, fit a linear model according to to my um, to my covariance and see how much contribution of variance do I see in my data according to my covariance which I know so far. So in this case, I see disease and gender and age are playing a role. The technical, the postmortem delay, and the pathology of the sample I probably can neglect at that point in time. So I fit my model, and this is basically the frequency of um, of each transcript at each 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 plot in that um, scatter plot is is a feature, and um, that is what I would expect, and that is how it actually looks, the variance, and then I can do a pairwise comparison of each feature, simple t-test in the end, and um, get a p-value out of it, how big and a rock fold change in case versus control, how much difference do I have. <coughs> the only problem which we have in, in, in comparison to normal statistics is that I run this, this, this pairwise comparison 200,000 times. If I set a p-value of 1%, of I still have a type 1 error of 2,000 features, which is completely unfeasible to, to deal with. So we have to correct for that. We use that, uh, we use bon, bon, Bonferroni or Benjamini Hochberg to do that. And so we basically get three values out of it, a, a log fold change between the samples, a p-value, and, um, and a false discovery rate. According to that, I can then plot my my features again according to frequency and the log fold change and in red I highlighted here which one made my threshold according to p-value force discovery rate and log fold change. As you can see here in lower abundance, lower frequency, um, I need a much, much um, a higher confidence interval to, 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 to gain statistical significance to call my features. Since I do p-value correction, I quickly have a look at my p-value distribution. Is everything OK? Am I still on the, on the good side? Then I do kind of a, a backup thingy. Um, I take everything which was differentially expressed, transform the values into the normal space, but with z-scores, and do an unsupervised clustering, and hope that my heat plot of the normalized um, expression counts separates in A versus B, case versus control. If I've done that, I'm happy I go home and uh, open the beer, and then the analysis so far was OK. Lots of time it looks like this. And um, that's, uh, yeah, happens. Sometimes we can fix it, sometimes we can't. Um, cool, having, having that. Um, I'm super surprised with the one on the 
something weird about having these nested, hi nested hierarchies. Something's <laughs> going wrong. Yeah, we can, we can discuss that later. <laughs> um, so all these, all the let's let's assume like all these 475 genes are really differentially expressed between Parkinson's and, and disease would already give us an inroad in what we're dealing with. So um, most of these genes might be known to biologists for a long time. So there's previous knowledge about that. So I can go back into databases and see which terms have been used for these genes before. Like, do, what do we know about them? These are classified in, in certain boxes. They get they they get categorization labels basically. And I simply have a look which of these categorization labels in my in my subset of data is enriched in comparison to a statistical sampling of, of, of what I found if I would pull 475 genes out, out by chance. Um, this data is quite hierarchical, so I know which, um, which box belongs to which, and I can then um, cluster that in, in a way um, according to the, the gene ontology, like the, 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 the hierarchical underlying features of that, and might get something which is interesting for my disease, um, enriched in most of the cases, and that is another confidence, and I will then um, follow probably this biological pathway which I could identify at that point in time. No, that's, uh, that's actually an R package which got released like two or three months ago which utilizes its data in that, in that way. It's, um, <coughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's really good. I like it. <laughs> That's a good job. Tell us what package it is. Oh, yeah, it's called Top Goal. Yeah. It's, I don't know if it's a use for general data science because it's specified on these gene ontology terms. Lots of the data we have, like, lots of the R packages I'm dealing with are quite specifically written for, for my field, which I think is a shame because the, the overlap is tremendous in what you actually do for that Um. Cool, that's one, one way to do it. This is the pairwise comparison. Another way to do it is co-expression analysis. So basically what we do is, um, we that was before, what we do is like which correlation, like which groups of, of, of features move together. Like which goes up and down, two features go up and down in all the samples in comparison to the third feature. Like defining modules of things which move together. Co-expression analysis. The way we are doing this, we're we, we build a correlation matrix, a pairwise correlation matrix. Um, in this case, um, I use Pearson's. You can pretty much use whatever you, whatever you like. I mean, the outcomes are obviously different, but Pearson does a good job so far. And um, we then build um, a hierarchical um, tree where we cluster according to their um, according to their modules. We cluster the um, the, top um, the, the, the topography um, together to identify models. So. Depending on how we cut our tree, we define our modules in the lower part here. And these are different ways of cutting them. And in the end, we get modules which have a um, certain identifier. In this case, it's its color. And we know, OK, these modules contain um, a subset of features which um, behave, which co-express um, together in a, in a certain way. We have no idea why they do that and what it is correlated to. So what's that? that's the next step. Over each of the samples, we ca calculate an eigenvalue. So basically, we're trying to decompose the data again and correlate that um, to, like this has been done for every samples we put in, in this case, 60, and correlate it back to our covariant matrix to then identify, OK, module gray gave me the biggest correlation to condition and not to age or, or gender or whatever. So module gray probably is the module which condemned which condenses the information I'm interested in at that point in time. I can then cluster my module again. This is the eye value expression. You can see in white gray bars here is the condition versus control uh, printed. And this, this, this is where the correlation comes together. I can harvest the gene ontology again and see does it make sense. And all these, all these terms are bang on for Parkinson's disease energy deficiency in the brain, so mitochondria plays a big role. And what I can do then after doing that is I can extract um, the information which is known about these genes and build, build a network to know, OK, the contrast is a bit bad. Each of these nodes basically is a gene, and these are known interactions. And we can then simply identify 
nodes with a very high interconnectivity and these might be the first thing we are trying to knock out or modify in a therapy or investigate in the lab. So that's a good way to narrow down targets that the student or whoever is doing it afterwards doesn't have to pipe with 475 genes on the bench. Um, that's the module way approach and um, then the statistical learning approach that was basically like looking at my data I got interested in that like a year or so ago um, where when I when I when I looked at it and basically um, noticed that I can't grasp what we're dealing with so it's, it's too too deep too complex it's too complicated so um, what is more complicated than that training models on it and um, that is what, 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 what we did. Like I started um, a project in that regard and I was quite intrigued by the possibilities um, in the field when I started reading into that. And you guys probably know way more than, than I do about that. But um, the ability of taking the existing data to, to train a model and then test afterwards in an unseen cohort is basically what we want to do when a patient presents in the clinic and we have maybe features that we want to look at and then assess their risk. That is exactly what we want to do. So <clears throat> the beauty of that is that it can determine complex patterns and the other thing was a pairwise or a module-wise comparison. Then I was like, okay, which, which algorithm should I use? <laughs> it's like, okay. um, so we started doing it in, in, in the obvious way. We split our data set training and testing we, 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 we determine our accuracy. Nowadays we don't do it with um, accuracy anymore, but like at that point in time we did it. Um, and then what we basically um, found out, the amount of features we have for most of the statistical model is simply not possible to deal with. We can't feed, um, I don't know, 200,000 features into a machine, even with half a terabyte of RAM, it doesn't work. So we have to, um, and then, yeah, okay, we don't really have to, we only need to find the important features. Um, so what we basically did is um, we, we applied different algorithms, um, which we selected, I will show you which one we, we, we used, and ranked feature by importance. Unfortunately, not every algorithm gives you the feature importance. Some you can tickle it out of, some you can't. And uh, we plot that over our features, and then select an area under the curve, um, cut off and um, discard, discard every feature which is below the cutoff and take this away and features. And most of you guys will be familiar with the concept of feature selection. Um, there was one thing we did to reduce our feature size dramatically, and we use um, GlimNet and SVM in combination with Random Forest so far because it works quite well, depending on our data. Um, and therefore reduce the amount of features um, we want to look at. Um, then, um, when looking at different algorithm, it is kind of self-explanatory that the underlying theory behind modeling algorithms are quite different. Um, a tree-based algorithm or a kernel-based algorithm is, um, is, is just theoretically a very different pair of choose and um, therefore the algorithm performs is very data reliant. So we're, run, we're running it on a very famous um, biology data set and we saw very different accuracy as one would expect. Then we ran um, the same set of algorithms, we ranked them and ran the same set of algorithms on different type of data sets and found that they all perform differently depending on different data sets. Not so surprising but quite tedious to always um, write your R code in new and um, so we, we, we determined that we actually have to, um, to be able to test all of the algorithms we are interested in on our data set to find the best model. I then tried to, um, or I started to, to write an R package about that time to, to do that and um, um, just didn't get very far. Unfortunately, I got a, got a student, bachelor student, very talented guy at that point in time, Zach, is sitting here as well, and say hello to him later. He then um, coded an R package for me, which um, we call Blackbox. And um, basically what it does, it, it does all the things. It, um, it utilizes all the eight algorithms I'm going to show you later. It simply takes a table, it feature selects, you can set the area under the curve, you can set which feature selection algorithm you want, which, which, um, which algorithm you want to exclude out of the data set. 
and it does cross-fold validation and nested cross-fold validation based on the data. We hope to have it on 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 on, on CRAN and hopefully in the next couple of weeks. It's, it's, it's finally running stable, and um, yeah, we're getting results out of it, which is good. Um, we or Zach wrote it in a way that we can slot very easily additional um, additional um, functionality into it. So if we want to have a new algorithm be part of that, it can be can be done quite easily. Um, we went through the literature and basically wanted to look like which algorithm cover the broadest range of theory. And if you guys have a, a suggestion which additional algorithm we should use, which might perform well in our certain um, question, that would be awesome to hear and then we could implement it. Um, this is the, the flow diagram which could we put it in. Depending on the function you invoke, it runs your algorithm, it gives you a graphical output, it gives a feature, feature selection, all of that. And currently we have three functions. We have a simple training testing with normal holdout, we have the crossword validation, and we have a nested crossword validation. We implemented the nested crossword validation due to a hint from Eugene and other people because we basically saw too high accuracy based on random data which we fed it. It was part of the problem that if you have 200,000 features, you always find a subset which pretty much classifies everything, which is uh, kind of problematic, particularly in our area, if you want to have a biomarker test afterwards. So the first result is, um, which Zach pulled off the cluster like actually an hour before we came here, is, um, is our error rate is finally um, where we would want it to be. Um, so around 0.5 percent on these five algorithms, the rest is still running. And our area under the curve in our PD data is with different feature subset. Don't go into details what, what, what they actually are. We get an accuracy of over 80 percent, which is tremendous for Parkinson's disease. If that actually holds true, we have, we have a really good story. Um, all that happened on a 10 times repetition on five inner and five outer holes. And um, yeah. So that's basically it. Like I told you three different approaches how I'm trying to analyze my data. The direct pairwise comparison, the co-expression module, and the classifier approach we're trying to do. The yarn ASIC and the bioinformatics world where I'm in is fairly new. There's nothing really established. But in the end you see, like in the end we end we, we, we end up with probably the same problems as you guys in your daily work. Um, I gave you a very brief overview about my high, 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 high computing um, pipeline and um, the problem is broad, but shallow and high dimensional data. But the good part is we only need to solve this problem once. Once we have to, once we have a feature set distinguished, we actually have an inroad to, to cure really devastating disease. Like from that point in time, it might be very easy for the biologists to team <coughs> apart and actually say, okay, that's where we need to target our drug. And we might already have a drug for that, but we don't really know which pathway we have to we have to target. And defining, identifying the features is the key point at that point in time. The remaining challenges is like we have massive type one error due to our P over triple N. And what we obviously can do, we can increase our N, we're working on that. We're trying to reduce our noise based on better experimental techniques and also on in silico. We're looking into feature engineering. That would be very helpful if you guys have ideas in that regard. And particularly the better statistical approaches like ensemble learning, better feature selection and stuff like that. So I have to acknowledge a, a heap of people, Zach, who, um, who did the uh, coding. Um, Eugene and Marx who helped me and gave me insights in the math in combination with Mark and other people at the Gov, my funding agencies, HMRC and Michael J. Fox and all these people who provide money for what we're doing. The Garvin Institute, basically every division we are we are working and trying approaches like that. And we are all puzzled by the problems we are having. But all of these are complex diseases which would benefit from an approach. From, from, from feature selection and an identification of which subset of features or gene is actually the right ones to deal with. 
And um, well, you're for your attention, and I'm happy to ask questions. Thank you. Yeah, question here. I'm interested to know whether the features are fully independent. No, no, no they are. They are. They, they, they are most probably correlated, and um, and and it's 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 biology. It's very very interconnected. So um, the, f the feature by itself might be affected by by by, by up to tens and hundreds of other features. Okay, so do you have a way to um, identify what those um, clusters are? Well, there, there are probably two ways. We can, we can, we can run, um, we could, could, could try to tr e extract that um, interconnectivity out of, out of models, but we also have biology data where we know which feature is connected to a certain extent. So that 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 is that is definitely would be a good approach to to, to go ahead. The the biggest problem we have is that we are still working on our annotation. We're still finding new features pretty much every day. And the the ontology, um, which is the databases, is based on a freeze which is a couple of years old. So um, we we have a very sparse on ontology matrix, which is which is problematic in that regard. But but but. Would be an inroad, yes. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank um, you. The other suggestion or question actually I had was whether you've considered using deep learning as a pre-processing yeah. step for um, not yet features. Mm -hmm. in there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Might 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 help. Yes. I'm I'm like the <coughs> problem is like I'm working on a lot of things simultaneously and I'm tr like I'm having to fulfill a lot of questions for my superior who yeah. wants like have a look at this and that, it doesn't really mean that we always work on the best project at that point in time. Um, sorry, I don't have a question, just two suggestions, because you asked for a suggestion. Um, for the feature selection, you can definitely use deep, deep learning, um, yeah. um, convolutional deep belief networks. It's Sounds to me, I'm not a biologist, but by what I saw, I think you can definitely use that. And um, about this CPU thing, I, can, I think you can easily use a very, um, you know, moderate GPU and speed up the process instead of using a massive cluster of CPUs. And yes. then, and I, I don't, I'm not talking about Tesla, for example, which costs eight thousand. But we we have a we have a Tesla uh, compute now. Mm -hmm. The problem is nobody uses it because um, the the code every bioinformatician writes its own code. It's in twenty different languages. It's more or less um, good or bad, and <laughs> so transporting that code into C or whatever the GPU can interpret would make sense at a certain time. And like we probably at nowadays at the point where we could say this is really useful algorithm, we want to transport that or pay somebody to do that and therefore reduce our but we do things in a very, very crude way. Like most of my pipeline, it's it's one it's a one step pipeline nowadays, but I chain it all together in batch and I have all my checkpoints and everything like that because it's the way I started at some point and it does a job. But I would be a I would be so much quicker if I would use higher higher languages, but like there's only so much uh, funding we have. But if you have a good suggestion for the, I, I come to you later. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned that you've got lots and lots of false positives. I'd be really interested to know how you set up a, a framework to sort of test what you find out of this, because I mean I think that's probably the the big elephant in the room around this is that you know we can throw exactly. lots of compute against this and get lots of apparently interesting features, but how do we actually make sure we're not kidding ourselves? Yes, and that got me into deep trouble with my boss because I actually started um, spiking in um, concentrations of molecules where I knew the exact concentration of and their composition, so I knew the features, how they look, and then I started analyzing all these kind of things and built like a correlated basically what kind of approach of my 20, 30, 40 different steps I do correlates best to what I put in in the first place. And the answer is shocking. 
It's like the most standard techniques which are used in the field. We are, I'm trying to publish this in a couple of weeks. It's like gives you gives you a correlation of 0.53 or something like that. So you have three percent of our chance and all this. And when you use the wrong tools in applying to to do these kind of things, um, it could reduce the noise and it will do that. But um, well, that's one approach to it. But um, in the end, we have to we have to um, we have to test it, and and, and the, the the biggest problem we have like there 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 are two other problems which are not mentioned at that point in time. We do it on, in the tissue, which is uh, the closest related to the disease. We do it in the human brain. We can't develop a biomarker test by probing people's brains. So we have to we have to develop a technique, or we have to find a pattern which is also sustained in other tissues in the body, which is not a given thing. And the other thing is all of these people have been on heavy medication for a long time. We might train our models based on that. That are things we are aware of, but we, are, we, well, we have to take them to. We, we know them, but like, well, people know them, but yeah, we can do nothing about that. Do you, do you use all of that um, prior to <laughs> I do. <laughs> do you use all of that prior data and the, the, you know, the ontology and things like that in your feature selection? No. Um, it's basically along the line from, from the question we had in, in the beginning. Um, that's due to two points. One point is that if I use the wrong model to annotate these and select these features, I have a correlation to what I put in, 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 in that. And and it, 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 it gets very, very complicated and you have to, like, there, there, there are approaches where people harvest literature and um, basically say, okay, we have 17 publications which say feature A is connected to feature B. That is very, very beautiful uh, support. But it might, there might be one publication which came out two months ago which says all of these 17 publications are crap. Um, the problem is, like, it's still very valid to do that. There would be a massive, massive network feeding all that in, like building multiple dimensionalities or stacks of data and, and trying to, to do that. We don't have any central repository for these kind of data sets. Uh, like whatever university is funding at a certain point in time, there are a couple of established databases which are more or less okay. But the, the main data for this genome ontology terms hasn't been updated for four years. So that's, but like that, that would be definitely a, a way into it. But like it's, it's very fractured. Academia is very fractured in these databases in, in many ways, which is a problem. Hopefully, it will change. Hey there. Um, I've got to say, absolutely fascinating presentation. Thank you very much for giving it. Um, I speak from a biased point of view because I'm actually a type one diabetic, and when I hear about the Parkinson's disease and then obviously other um, degenerative uh, diseases, I wonder. How does Parkinson's disease and diabetes, etc., how, how does it fit on the spectrum of what attention is being paid to different diseases and the development and analysis behind them? Well, the, um, underlying, the, the underlying genetic component is something we, we are not getting right yet. That is the biggest problem. That's, that's the main basis for my work because the, in, like what, what has been considered functional in the human genome was 1.5 to 1.8 percent, which is the protein coding part of the genome. This is what we knew, and this is what our medicine has been based on in the last hundred years, basically. New endeavors where we sequence everything told us 63 to 80 percent of the human genome is actively transcribed, spliced, is worked with which indicates there's a whole dark matter out there which we've never looked at. Looking at that tells us that, okay, there are things which we have never considered. Um, therefore, the calculation of saying that type 1 or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's hereditary to 15% to is in my book um, not very, I think it's much, much higher, the genetic component we have. Um, we can apply these kind of approaches on pretty much everything. There are also there are other le levels of data which I haven't talked about, which would, which which are accessible. I think in the end we have a very very deterministic, a big big complex deterministic system. I think there is an answer in that data. We just have to find the right ways of 
of pulling it all together and then, 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 then nailing it down because we get very distinct phenotypic type of diseases which we can classify and then say, okay, this is this is this disease, and there must be a common common descriptor for each of this. That finding that would be pretty cool. Well, thank you very much for all the questions, and if there are more questions, Boris will be hanging around after the presentation, so you can ask him that. Please so join me in thanking.